been in this series called You Belong, uh, talking about the fact that a lot of times nowadays we struggle with that question. Where do I actually belong? We want to belong to a, to a place, to a group of people. We want to feel like we're a part of something bigger than ourselves, but we really struggle with the question, where is it that I actually do belong? So we've been looking at this. And we looked at the prodigal son and that he tried to find his place. And really the, God, the, the father, God, was inviting him back because where we belong is with God. And even the, the son who stayed back, he was looking for where he belonged. He was with God, but he didn't belong to God at that point because he was off on his own trying to earn his way. And God invites us and willingly accepts us into his family if we just trust him. And so today we're asking that question of where do I belong? And our passage takes us to a letter that was written to a church. Ephesians was a, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. And that, that church started back in the book of Acts, little Bible history for you, that started back in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19. Paul went there on his missionary journeys, and God started working in and through Paul, and the church began there. Paul has been off on other journeys since then, so he's writing a letter to address some of the issues that they're having. And this is where we read the very basic word for church in the Greek is Ecclesia. Ecclesia. There it is printed on the screen for you in English. This isn't the way it's written in Greek, but I figure most of you probably have not had Greek. So we're not going to make you take that test, okay? Besides, it's all Greek. There's a pun that got a few of you. So, but anyways, now Ecclesia in the very basic definition is just a gathering. It actually was not used to define the church. It was used in the common language to just describe a group of people that were together for one purpose. Now, it could have been something like to getting together for a political rally. That was an ecclesia. That was a gathering. It could have been for a sporting event or a concert or, or some kind of uh, demonstration of arts. And that was an ecclesia. So this whole idea of a church is just basically a gathering of people. But God, Jesus, redefined it when he spoke to Peter. Because he asked this question about who do people say that I am? And they answered all kinds of different things. And then finally Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? See, that's the question that we individually really need to answer for ourselves. Who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Is he a good teacher? Awesome. Is he a good man, a history figure? That's okay. For those of us who are a part of the church, we actually say he is our savior. He is our Messiah. He is God in the flesh. And he is the one who gives us purpose for our life. He is the one who brings us together. Ecclesia, when, it, when Peter answered this, that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God, then Jesus says, upon this rock, upon this idea, this principle of I am the Messiah, I'm going to gather people together and they will be my ecclesia. They will be my church. So Jesus was the one who gave us the, the meaning of church being a gathering of believers in Jesus Christ. And the church, I know the church has a, a checkered reputation out in society. I know that there are so many churches that claim to be churches that are not living under this idea that Jesus is our Messiah. He is the one reason we exist. 
There are so many out there, and I'm, I'm sorry that they exist. If you have been a part of that, you have probably been hurt by it. And I wish I could take away all of your pain from church hurt. That is a real thing. And I, I listen to those stories, and I ache. I grieve over the fact that so many of you have told me you have been hurt by a church that's, that's not the purpose of our church. That's not the goal. I can't promise you won't ever be hurt because the church is gathering of people. I mean, you look around this. You look at people you may or may not know. There is no reason except for God that we are all in the same room together. There is no reason that we should ever get along the way that we do. I mean, some of you like tea instead of coffee. <laughs> some of you don't watch any sports at all. How could you exist in life without... Yes, a bunch of you just raised your hand. I realize I'm probably one of the only sports guys in our church. And you can't count Rick because he votes for the Dallas Cowboys. So <laughs> I had to throw that in there. But we exist, we are together, not because of any personal preferences, not because of a shared common background, not because of an economical status or any position in our life. We are together for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is because we believe Jesus is our God. That's the only reason why we are together. And by the way, I make fun of a lot of the differences in our church, but that is really just in fun. I am really, truly, honestly amazed at the unity and the, the spirit of cooperation within our church. Because on the surface level, you're, we, can't, we shouldn't exist and we shouldn't function the way that we do, but because of our love for God, in our love for people, we do exist and we are growing and we are, we are just, we are a great group of people. If this is your first time with us, put us to the test. If this is your hundredth millionth time with us, put us to the test because we'll stand behind this. But for my own personal story, let me share with you. Some of my greatest moments in my life are because of the church. It's either they happened in the church or because of it. Let me share some of it. I was basically born in the church. Now, my mom didn't actually give birth to me in the nursery, but like day number two, I was there and Aunt May took me from my mother to hold me and she never let me go until I was like two. So my Aunt May, she's not really my aunt, but she was an old lady who loved kids in the nursery and she just loved on me from the day I was born and so I grew up in the church. I learned how to do things. I told you guys a few weeks ago that I learned how to make paper planes inside the church because I'd take the church bulletin and fold it up and we would throw them outside afterwards. I learned I did not like chewing gum in the church because every wonderful old lady in the church offered me a piece and I grew up never wanting to reject something a church lady would give to me. So I often had eight pieces of gum in my mouth on a Sunday morning. Either I had really bad breath, but it made me, it, it, it made me to where I don't like gum at all. I learned how to do some of my reading. I learned who I was in the church. I learned how to play some of the sports because of our children's activities. Learned how to, that I was good at some sports and not so good at others because of the church. Because our children's activities would put me to the test out there and I would fail at some and I would excel at others. So then when I got into school sports, I learned I knew exactly which sports I was going to do okay in. And so those were the sports I played. I met this one young lady, this cute little blonde at church, I was going to, we, it was a first Sunday at the church. It was a potluck Sunday, much like today. 
And so my family, we sat at one table and we, we didn't know anybody. So we kind of sat by ourselves and this cute little blonde came out and says, why don't you come sit with us? And all of our friends were sitting at the table. I ended up marrying that cute little blonde. Beth is the one. I met her in the church. We raised our kids in the church. We went on mission trips around the world because of the church. I made mistakes in the church. Some big ones. But I also received forgiveness in this church. Not this church specifically, but I, this church has forgiven me of a lot too. <laughs> but I've made mistakes and I've received forgiveness because of a church. I've met some of my best lifelong friends in the church. Anything that is significant in my life, Anything that has meaning in my life is because of or related to the church. Which takes me back to that question, where do we belong? Well, according to this, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus and he answers this question specifically. He is writing to address some issues and one of the first issues was who can belong to the church. And here's the, the paraphrase of it. Because of Christ, anyone and everyone can belong to the church. Let's read Ephesians chapter 2 and let me show you in the text. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you had previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But... God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. By the way, that'd be a good time to say amen. amen. <laughs> Verse 6, he raised us up with him and is seated us with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace Amen. through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So let me just, let's just jump right in. Because of the church, we can find a place to belong. And Paul is writing here and he's saying that because of Christ, everyone and anyone can belong to a church and should belong to a church. And he points it out here. Basically, he's laying out a, a very detailed explanation. So I'm going to summarize it and put it into ways that my simple brain can understand. So maybe, maybe you can understand it better than I can. But it starts with this. We all start the same. Every single person in this room, every single person inside of a church has the same beginning. For you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That means you were, and you were, and you were, and I was. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have come way short of God's plan and God's design for us. And because of that sin, because of our trespasses, which I'll explain a little bit more in a, in a second here, but because of those sins, we are dead according to the scripture. For the wages of sin is death. Now true, you're like, well, I've sinned plenty of times and I'm not dead yet. 
Has anybody ever thought like that? Most of us probably are thinking like, I should be dead because of some of my sins. I know that I've messed up enough. There's no reason I should be alive right now. But this is speaking spiritually. Because of our sins, because of the things that we have done against God, we are spiritually dead. There is not a one of us that has any righteousness or any good in us. Because we are full of sin. Our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. If you don't believe me, check the way that humans have existed from the beginning of time. History is full of evil. Well, I'm not that bad. We always have a favorite historical figure we look to and say, I'm not that bad. Whichever one it is that you're, I'm sure he was a very, he or she was a very bad person. And you're right. You may not be that bad. But see, that's the wrong measuring stick. The question is, are we good enough for God? And the answer is, we've all fallen short of the goodness of God. And so, therefore, we have all sinned. Sin is a, an archery term. I'm sure some of you have heard this before. But an archer, unless he hits the bullseye every single time, when he misses, even by centimeters, it is called a sin. So unless he hits dead center bullseye, he has sinned. And all of us have missed the mark of God. God had a plan for us. We've tried our best. We miss. Some of us miss the entire target. If you've ever done archery, it was one of my favorite things when we'd go to take youth to camp and we would have an archery out there and some little junior high boy or girl, they would get a bow and arrow in their hands for the first time and they would draw it back and then all of a sudden they would release it. That, bow, that, that arrow, sometimes the bow, but that arrow at least would go way off and would not even hit anything close to the target. Sometimes they'd go way over. Sometimes they'd hit the dirt. And I saw one kid actually try to skip it off the dirt. I thought, that's an interesting way. But this concept comes back to, okay, for you personally, have you kept all the commandments of God? Let's start with this. We're told of a ten, the ten basic commandments of God, the ten commandments, right? Right? Most of us have heard those before. We can go through the list. And you can say, well, I haven't done that, and I haven't done that, and I haven't done that. Jesus comes back and says, okay, you say that you haven't done, you haven't committed murder. Great, good for you. That's always everyone's go-to. Well, at least I haven't killed anybody. The fact that that's the first thing that you think of means it's in your heart somewhere that you have thought about killing someone. And at least I haven't killed him, so I'm not that bad of a person. Jesus says this, have you ever hated anybody? If you have ever had hate in your heart, it is the same sin as committing a murder. Ouch. Wow. Man, I guess I did miss the mark on that one. Well, some of you have gone, well, at least I haven't committed adultery. Good. You've done good by not committing adultery. But again, that's in your heart then, huh? And if you've ever looked at another person lustfully, and you've had those thoughts in your head, you have committed the sin of adultery in your heart. You have missed the mark. We have all missed the mark. Everyone in this room has started from the same place. We are dead because of our sin. And I've got a silly little question. You know, back in elementary school, they teach you there are no such thing as a stupid question, right? 
but there's some that get pretty close to being a stupid question. This sounds a little bit like it, and I have it for you. What can a dead person do? Uh huh. <laughs> Decompose, turn into dust. Can they do anything for themselves? Can they do anything to help themselves? Can they improve their situation at all? No, they're dead. There's a story, folklore type of story, of a man named Jeremy Bentham. He was a philosopher and an interesting figure, to say the least. The story goes like this, that he left a very large contribution to the University College of London. Okay? I don't know why they have to double down on University College, but London has to do its own thing, okay? So UCL, they received this very large contribution from Mr. Bentham under one condition. They would receive all this money that he had if and only if they followed this one rule that he was present at every single board meeting. Now think about this. He's dead. How would a dead person attend a board meeting for a university? Well, they had to get creative because they didn't want to go back on Mr. Bentham's request and reject the money, so they had to find a way. So what they did was they wrapped up his skeleton in a wax type of figure, so his actual bones were there, and he looked like a person, a wax person, if you've ever been in one of those wax museums. And they would wheel him in in a wheelchair and sit him at the head of the board table for 100 years. They did this. His remains would be sitting in a case for a board meeting. They would wheel him out put him at the head of the table, and the minutes from these meetings would read this. Mr. Jeremy Bentham present, but not voting. <laughs> because a dead person can't vote. A dead person can't share their opinions. A dead person cannot do anything to help. We all start off as dead people because of our sin. And it's not like the little movie quote that says, well, that person is just mostly dead. Not all the way dead, just mostly dead. Which means they're partly alive. No, they're all dead. We are all dead in our sin We follow the patterns of this world, the patterns of Satan, and our sinful desires, and Paul points them out very carefully. He says, listen, you have, you have lived according to the ways of this world. Check, we've done that. We've, done, we've lived according to the ruler of the power of the air. Now, you don't want to think that we've followed Satan, but we have. We have worked in disobedience and lived previously among them in our own fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. Check, check, check. We all start off the same way. We are all sinful, dead, spiritual people. Well, pastor, that's an encouraging way to start off a sermon. Hey, I'm just telling you, we're all in the same boat here in this church. We all start off in the same place, but the good news is that we are all saved the same way. We are all saved by the grace of God. I love that phrase in verse 4, and you've probably heard me say this again, and you'll, you'll hear me say it in the future. We may even do a series on it. I think that would be fun. But God... That changes everything right there. Those two words, but God shows up. But God can raise the dead. But God can bring us alive. And that's what he's, Paul says here. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love for us, made us alive 
in Christ. Man, we are all saved the same way. Our testimonies may be different. Some of you may have a much more colorful dead story. Some of us were just dead and laying there and rotting. But all of us were dead in our sins. But God. Now there's some key words here that we better describe here. Let's start with the, one, the first one he says here. But God who is rich in mercy. Mercy is a key word for salvation we need to understand. Because again... Dead person can do nothing to raise himself. Dead person can do nothing to become alive again. So it's only by the compassionate kindness of an almighty God who makes us alive. That is mercy. The compassion, kindness that God has shown us to look on us even while we were his enemies in sin, that is God's mercy. And then Paul tells us why God gives us mercy. It's because of his love for us. Now in our English language, we were, use the word love in a lot of different ways. You can love your truck. You can love your wife and you can love your children and you can love ice cream. All those mean something different. You do not love your wife the way you love your truck. You do not love your children the way you love ice cream. I sure hope you don't. That, the, the word love in the English language gets confused a lot. In the Greek, there were actually different words for the different types of love. This word here is unconditional love. Meaning this, and I love explaining this this way. God's love for us, there is nothing you can do to get more of it, and there is nothing you can do to make him love you any less. It is unconditional. You have nothing to do with how much God loves you. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. That's it. God does this because he first loved us. Period. End of story. His love is unconditional. But God, because of his great love, made us alive. And then Paul goes on to say this, that we are saved by grace. Grace is that favor, unconditional favor, from someone who is more powerful than you. That's grace. Someone who gives you favor when you don't deserve it. You can't earn it again. See, we are all, we all start off the same and we are all saved the same way. We did nothing to earn our salvation. You weren't good enough. You didn't clean yourself up enough. You didn't read your Bible enough. You didn't pray enough to be saved. You are only saved because Jesus died on the cross for your sins and you put your faith in him and him alone for new life. We are all saved the same way. That, that word that, where, that, where he says that we are made alive, in the Greek, it actually is to reanimate. Some of you classic movie buffs may understand that reanimation. It's a reanimation. Frankenstein's monster, Right? How much did Frankenstein's monster do to contribute to a new life that he had? Nothing. We do nothing to come alive again. It's alive! We are all saved the same way. It's only by the mercy, love, and grace of God that we even have a chance at a spiritual life. And it's only because of what Jesus did on the cross that we can stand forgiven and being called a child of God. 
Every single person, this fits everybody's story because we all start off the same. We are all saved the same way. And then this part gets me is that we grow together. We grow together. See, spiritual life is vitally important to the Christian experience. Spiritual growth needs to happen. Meaning this, that if you are at the same spot you were when you first believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're still at that same spot, and you haven't done anything to grow, God hasn't worked in your life, and you haven't recognized the work in His work in your life, you are still stuck in the infancy phases, there's something wrong. Think about it this way. When, when our daughter was born, she had a bunch of health complications. She's getting ready to graduate college. I'm waiting to hear whether she's at the top of her class or not, but she's getting ready to graduate. When she started off, we were told that she was not going to be able to do most of the things that she's done in her life. But we had certain things that we were watching for. I'll never forget, because she spent a long time in the NICU, the NICU, the neonatal center for infants. She spent a long time in there. And there were certain marks that we had to, to see happen in her development in order to, to graduate out of there. The, the last one, the biggest one, is that she had to have a dirty diaper. We had a poop party that day. <laughs> it's a huge developmental milestone for a child with, with some of her conditions. I know some babies are born and they just, they, they know how to poop everywhere and they are glad to share it with everybody. And I've got stories to go along with that one if you want, but we'll save those for later. But learning how to eat, learning how to feed yourself, learning how to walk, learning how to talk or communicate at any form, at any level, those are some developmental marks. And if you don't meet them, if you don't see them in a child, then you know something's wrong. You need to get help. And there are resources that are out there. I'm glad that we live in a society where we can get some of those resources now that weren't available in the past. But the same is true for our spiritual life. See, God designed all life to have a momentum of growth. If you're not growing, you're dying. Whether we're talking about a church or an individual. Or if we're talking about someone's actual physical life. If you're not developing, if you're not growing and maturing, then you're dying. The same is true spiritually. So we need to have spiritual mi milestones because, as Paul says, we are created by God for good works. Now, let me quickly clarify this. We are not saved by our good works. We, Paul already said that. No one gets to brag about, I helped God save me. You did nothing to save yourself. You cannot do anything to save yourself. So we don't get to brag that I was such a good person. God saved me because I was already clean. No, that's not the way this works. But once we are saved, we are created by God new for good works. We show that we are now alive in Christ because of the good works that we do. Not to earn favor from God or from others, but to prove that we are learning to live and walk and talk just like Jesus did. We are becoming more Christ-like every day. We are created for good works. I love the way James put this. That faith without works is dead. And so if you want to show me that you have faith, but you don't do anything with it, well, that says a lot. 
I'll show you that I have faith in Jesus Christ by what I do with my life. By how I live, what I say, how generous I am. All growth happens, especially spiritual growth happens best in the church environment. A healthy church environment. A church that is really seeking to be united in Christ. The way that Paul is describing here in Ephesians. So let me get to the point here of this. There are so many people who are disconnected. So many people who are alone and desperate and feel trapped by their own life. And so they become hopeless and helpless and desperate for any signs that they belong. We're trying to live out this life on our own and it's not working. Living any part of this life, well, I, I can do it all by myself. Mm. Yeah. I can point you to a bunch of people that have lived there, been there, done that, and they failed and they'll tell you they failed. Trying to live life alone just does not work. We get frustrated and so we slip back into these bad rhythms of living according to the way of the world, living according to the way of Satan, living according to the way of our fleshly desires and thoughts. We fall back into that. And the pain, let me share part of my pain. Part of the things I wrestle with the most is that I see so many of, so many of you, so many people around our church and in our community who are striving to earn God's favor and God's grace by what they do, they're spinning their, their wheels and they're just getting tired. That's not the Christian life. The lost are trying to earn their salvation. Believers are trying to earn favor with God by what they do. Instead of living in the grace that God has given us, we're trying to earn more of it by being good church people. That hurts me because I know that that's a frustrating, pointless life to live. So let me share this. Our church exists to love God and love people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we exist. We all start off the same way. We are all saved the same way. And the point is for all of us to grow together. To become one church, one ecclesia of people who will tell others about Jesus, that want others to join us. Because He is the answer. Not our church. But he is the answer and he's the one who started the church. So my question to you today is this. Do you belong to a church? Do you belong to a church? See, a lot of people just go to church. If you go to church, you can leave a church. And there's nothing to it. If you go to church, you come in here on Sunday, you, you hear the pastor speak, and you know what? If that's where you're at, I would rather you come to church than not. But the ultimate goal is that you belong to a church. Yeah, I would love, because I love all of you, I would love it if you belong to this church. But you know what? I know we're not the church for everybody. But there are other Christian Bible teaching churches you may be belong to able to belong to. The point is, belong to a church so it becomes part of your identity, part of who you are, that you have a people to call your own. And we become more like a family than just a random gathering of strangers. Thank you for joining us for worship today. I hope and pray that God has challenged or inspired you through this message. And if he has, please leave a comment or send us an email and let us know. Also, you could do those same things to let us know if there's any prayer requests you have that we could join you in prayer for. Thank you again for watching. 
Hope to see you again soon. God bless you.